Welcome to Portland. Today, you guys are going to be looking at two different plays by Brecht. The first is Measures Taken, which is an early example of epic theater and a very extreme one. The second, Good Person of Such One, which represents Brecht's more sophisticated, mature ideas of epic theater. Before you do that, I want to give you a quick overview of what exactly Brecht meant by epic theater. Brecht believed that in the modern world, a very small number of people had managed to accumulate all the wealth and all the power into their own hands and to convince the vast majority of people in the world to work against their own best interests and ultimately serve the interest of just these few. And he thought that theater had the potential to wake people up, to get them to see the way that they were being victimized. He believed that theater had the power to change the world. But theater as it existed in his time wasn't doing that at all. Most popular theater, like melodramas, well-made plays, simply distracted you. They made you stop thinking altogether. They swept you up into this fantasy world, took you on a roller coaster ride of suspense and excitement, and then when a play was over, you applauded, you smiled, you went home, you went to sleep, you went back to work. The forms of serious modern drama that we've been looking at so far this semester are no better at all from Brecht's point of view. In fact, in some ways, they're a lot worse. Think specifically about Stanislavski's form of psychological realism. The goal of psychological realism, remember, is for the actor to become one with the character and to represent the character as a full, rich, three-dimensional psychological being. The result is that the audience ends up empathizing with the character. Even the most villainous, evil character becomes explicable and in some sense sympathetic. Early in his life, Brecht was drawn to expressionism, in other words, to the lyric strand of theater that we've been talking about. But soon he came to realize that that was no better at all, because ultimately, even the most intense, anguished, expressionistic theater appealed to your emotions and simply gave the audience a sense of despair and hopelessness, rather than giving them an opportunity to think critically about the underlying causes of the problems they were experiencing in their lives. When Brecht encountered Biscotter's idea of an epic theater, a political theater, he latched onto it. He recognized, finally, a whole new approach of theater that would become his guiding principle for the rest of his life. So how do you create this kind of epic attitude in an audience? Through what Brecht called the Verfremdung effect, which today people often simply abbreviate as the V effect. Originally, when Brecht was translated into English, people used the term alienation effect. So you might see that term in some older writings. But that translation was very misleading, and people who really understand Brecht have stopped using it. First of all, the term alienation is a Marxist concept. It means that the worker is alienated from their labor, which is a bad thing. Whereas distancing, in Brecht's sense, is a really good thing. Even worse, the term alienation sounds creepy, strange, alien. And in fact, in the 1960s, when people in the English-speaking world first started to embrace Brecht, they would often present Brecht's plays as if they were strange, creepy, bizarre. That has absolutely nothing to do with what Brecht meant by Verfremsdung, or distancing. Stanislavski took as the problem that actors were distant from their characters and tried to create a kind of melding, to bring them as close together as possible. Whereas Brecht felt that people's natural impulse was to empathize, to get sucked in. And so he felt that he had to develop special techniques precisely to separate, to pull actors apart from their characters and the audience apart from the actors so that everybody is thinking on their own as individuals in a critical way. The way that uh, Brecht described this is he wanted the audience to be sitting back in their seats smoking their cigars, keeping their hats on, believed that theater that created a compelling illusion of reality for the audience was profoundly dishonest, and that in fact it was a pernicious form of propaganda because it presented one particular set of biases, one point of view, as being objective reality, not giving the audience the opportunity to question it. 
For Brecht, this concept of Erfremsdung was absolutely central to every aspect of making theater. He applied it to his new approach to writing plays. He applied it to a new approach to designing scenery, costumes, lighting, and he applied it to acting, developing a theory of acting that was radically at odds with the Stanislavski system that had just gained traction in the United States and much of the Western world. Let's start with how the idea of epic theater applies to writing plays. In conventional plays, the plot has a sweeping momentum to it. It creates suspense that keeps the audience on the edge of its seat, wondering what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. Brecht didn't want suspense. He wants an audience to sit back and think. So he creates plays using an episodic structure, much as expressionist like drama did, but for a different purpose. Each scene has a clear beginning and end, and at the end, the audience has an opportunity to stop, pause, and reflect back on what they've just seen, what it means, how things might have gone differently before moving on to the next scene. All right, so how does he do this? Well, first of all, very often Brecht would title his scenes, and these titles would either define the overall theme of a scene, or in some cases, they would even tell the audience what's going to happen in the scene and deliberately destroy the suspense. For example, in one of the key scenes of the play Mother Courage and His Children, one of uh, Mother uh, Courage's children is killed at the end of the scene. And the scene begins with a title that says that the third child is going to die. This way, the audience, instead of wondering what's going to happen, is the child going to die? The audience is watching from the beginning to say, how is this going to happen? Why is the son going to die? What choices is Mother Courage making that's leading to this result? And what could she do that might make things happen differently? In other words, it encourages the audience to be distanced from what's going on and to think about alternatives to what's actually happening in the play. Another technique that Brecht uses is to end scenes with a song. These songs, unlike traditional musical theater songs, aren't expressions of the characters' intense emotions, but rather they cut away from the action and they reflect on what's been going on. Often they present a kind of biting critical commentary on what the audience has just seen, generalizing on it. In other words, they pull you out of the action and create a distance. And in some of his plays, Brecht uses the most literal epic device of all. That is, he'll have one of the characters directly address the audience and serve as a kind of narrator commenting on the action and creating an ideological frame around the play. Now, let's consider how epic theater, and specifically the Verfremsdun effect, applies to scene design. Now, I already described the way that Brecht would very often title his scenes. For this to be effective, the audience has to see the titles, and that immediately becomes a design element. One of the most common techniques that Brecht used was to put the titles on placards, on signs, and these signs could either be held by actors, or in his case more often, be mounted somewhere in the set. So this is clearly, these placards, a very non-illusionistic, non-fourth wall kind of scenic element. In more uh, contemporary productions, people will often project the signs. Another technique that he used that was really revolutionary at the time was to allow the audience to see the scene changes taking place. Uh, the standard convention in his time was for a curtain to drop in between scenes and the scene changes would happen completely behind the curtains. Sometimes there would be a short scene uh, that the actors would perform in front of the curtain to cover that scene change. Okay? What Brecht did is he lowered the curtain only halfway, called it a half curtain, so that we could see the legs of the crew members and we could see the pieces moving in and out, uh, but we still clearly understood that we were in between scenes. Pretty quickly, they just stopped dropping the curtain altogether. What's really interesting here is it shows the way that a Verfremsdun effect is always dependent on a particular audience member's expectations. In other words, what works as a V effect for one audience at one moment in time isn't going to work in the future. 
These days, this convention of watching uh, the scenery uh, change in front of you, which was largely inspired by Brecht's extremely popular touring productions, that convention has become so widespread that it ceases to have any distancing effect whatsoever. So now, audiences can very happily see scene changes taking place in front of them, even in the middle of an Ibsen play or, um, or a Tennessee Williams play. It no longer shatters the illusion for us. And that helps to confirm what Brecht was saying, which is that the impulse toward illusion, the audience's capacity to become absorbed in the action, um, is incredibly strong. And the work that we need to do is to break that illusion. VFX inevitably lose their potency. And so every generation of theater artists needs to come up with its own set of techniques to create critical distance in its audience. Another technique that Brecht used to create a V effect that now audiences have become completely used to and no longer has any power at all to distance the audience was to show the lighting instruments. When Brecht was directing, the convention was to put all the lighting instruments above the proscenium arts where the audience couldn't see them. Brecht, on the other hand, made no effort whatsoever to conceal the lighting instruments. He wanted the audience to see that they were in a theater and that the lighting effects were synthetic. Today, of course, we see lighting instruments all the time and they're completely invisible to us. The most basic way that Brecht's designers would try to avoid illusion would be by avoiding scenic realism. The Brecht scene designs were never fourth wall realistic designs. Sometimes the scenery would be um, totally abstract. You would simply have ramps and platforms. Sometimes it would be highly painterly. Uh, later on in his career, Breck tended to use very realistic scenery uh, and props in particular very close to the actors. So if an actor was touching something, for example, if an actor was taking off a shoe, Brecht would use a real shoe in that case and think very, very carefully and often spend hours and hours trying to decide what kind of shoe exactly that should be uh, so that that shoe carried the maximum social meaning and message. What brand of shoe was it? Was it crusted with mud to show that this was a worker or was it um, you know, very shiny to show that this person uh, was very vain and, and spent a lot of money on their clothing? But as the scenic elements moved further from the actors, they become increasingly abstract and theatrical. Here again, though, very rapidly, these conventions that Brecht had established became extremely popular. And now we're very used to seeing what's called selective realism, even in the most illusionistic plays. Finally, let's talk a bit about Brecht's ideas of acting. Uh, the fundamental idea that underlies Brecht's theory of acting is acting in the third person. The idea is that I, as an actor, am standing in between you and the character. I don't become the character, I don't melt into the character, but I'm constantly commenting on the character. For uh, a Stanislavski trained actor, indicating is a bad thing. If an acting teacher doesn't like what you're doing, they'll often say, don't indicate, right? But for a Brechtian actor, indicating is a good thing. You want to be indicating. You want to be commenting. You don't want to be fully identified with the character. So how did Brecht try to achieve this technique? Well, he had developed a whole bunch of acting exercises. One of the most basic was to have the actors in rehearsal predicate their lines by saying, he said she said, sometimes with an adjective. He said angrily, go away, right? And that immediately causes me to indicate, to illustrate what I'm trying to do instead of identify fully with it. One of Brecht's most important essays in acting is called The Street Scene, and that's in your reading. In The Street Scene, Brecht draws a really compelling analogy. He says, imagine that there's been a car accident and the police come to the scene of the accident and interview witnesses to find out exactly what happened. Now you might imagine the witnesses, when they're describing what happened, begin to act out what they've seen. When they're acting it out, they're not doing it in order to create an illusion, they're doing it in order to create as clear and compelling 
an image of their perspective on the event as possible. So for example, one guy might say, oh, officer, it was terrible. There was this little old lady. She was like walking across the street. She was she was really sweet. Hi, how are you doing? I love you. Yes, oh, you're so wonderful. Yes, and she was giving candy to the little children. And she started to walk across the street. And then she saw a truck and a truck driver. Oh, I saw him. He was like this big, hot the truck. <laughs> And you could see that he was like really, really, really angry. Oh, who is that little old lady? Why is this rich, stupid little old lady in the middle of the street? Oh, I'm going to show her. And he like pressed the accelerator. And the little lady, oh no, what are you doing? please stop. <laughs> then somebody else says, hey, that's not what I saw at all. What are you, what are you talking about? Hey, I saw this really rich lady. He was like, hee 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 hee, how are you doing? Oh, please get out of the way, yes. This is my street, yes. And then this truck driver, you can see he was exhausted. He'd been working so hard, and he was like driving, and he saw the lady, 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 what are you doing? And she couldn't even slow down. She just owned the world. Oh, hello. <laughs> and the guy was like, no, no. It was awful. I feel so sorry for the poor guy. One strategy that Breck proposed in order to create an epic effect is to deliberately cast against type. For example, if the character is a huge, hulking figure, you might deliberately cast a very small, delicate actor. You might cast men to play women, or women to play men, or children to play adults, or adults to play children. You might cast one actor to play multiple different parts, perhaps using a mask or simply different physicalizations. And Brecht had a term that he used to describe these characterizations. He called them a gestos. So for him, a great actor will create a very powerful gestos that immediately, in one snap second, captures a complete character and the socioeconomic class of that character. For example, he talked about Charlie Chaplin's Tramp. Another extremely epic actor with a very, very distinctive gestos was Groucho Marx. The future of Fredonia rests on you. Promise me you'll follow in the footsteps of my husband. How do you like that? I haven't been on the job five minutes and already she's making advances to me. Not that I care, but where is your husband? Why, he's dead. I'll bet he's just using that as an excuse. I was with him till the very end. Hm, no wonder he passed away. I held him in my arms and kissed him. Oh, I see. Then it was murder. Or the vaudeville performer Bert Lahr, who, as I've mentioned before, was the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz. Shame on you! Look, what did you do that for? I didn't buy them! No, but you tried to. It's bad enough picking on a straw man, but when you go around picking on poor little dogs... Well, you didn't have to go and hit me, did you? Is my nose bleeding? Oh. More recent examples are the performers of Monty Python. Self-defense! Tonight I should be carrying on from where I got to last week when I was showing you how to defend yourself against anyone who attacks you armed with a piece of fresh fruit. <laughs> you promised you wouldn't do fruit this week. And even more recently, we have Saturday Night Live, which is a fantastic example of epic theater. Tonight I am here to bring you a message of healing and a show of unity along with Mike Pence and Senator Dianne Feinstein. <laughs> Last week, I met with a group of teenage survivors of gun violence, and I want to assure them once again that I hear you <laughs> and I care. So you can see there that performers are not in any way trying to create the illusion of the character. They're not trying to identify with the character or make you empathize with the character. Quite the contrary. They're trying to make you reflect on the character in a very critical way, and they're absolutely clear in their own point of view toward that character. Okay, so now I'd like you guys to explore these ideas of epic theater using one of Breck's early extremely epic plays. The play is called The Measures Taken, and it was written in 1930, right after Brecht began to develop the idea of epic theater. So it's really epic theater in its most extreme, pure, unsubtle form. 
It's an example of what Brecht called a learning play or a Lehrstücker. And he wrote it not to be performed in fancy theaters for bourgeois audiences, but to be performed by workers in factories. Or he wrote some Lehrstücke for children to perform in schools and to provoke discussion and political activism. And this form of Lehrstücke became enormously influential in the United States in the 1960s with uh, social activist theaters that we'll be talking about a little bit later. All right, so now I'm going to hand things over to Amy, who is going to direct you in a scene from The Measures Taken. And I want you to try to create the most epic version of this scene you possibly can. I look forward to seeing it. And I'll see you guys via Skype on Thursday.